thank you, Professor Powell, for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, especially the last sentence or two uh, indicated your awareness of market implications of competition. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Powell mentioned the book that I published uh, over four decades ago under the title Competition and Entrepreneurship. And when I received Professor Kat Powell's kind invitation to deliver a talk today uh, on entrepreneurship and competition theory with emphasis on its implications for public policy, I understood that Professor Powell wished my talk to revisit the themes of that primarily theoretical work, but to do so with an emphasis on the practical public policy lessons which we can learn from that theory. In attempting to fulfill this objective, however, it will be helpful to understand the 20th century history of what is known as the Austrian School of Economics and its relationship to the dominant, very much non-Austrian schools of thought, of thought during the same century. This will give me a welcome opportunity to dwell on the contributions of two giants in the Austrian tradition, Ludwig Mises and Friedrich Hayek, and I gladly grasp at this opportunity. My gladness is due in large part to the unfortunate circumstance that during most of their respected professional careers, mainstream economics unfairly dismissed these two great thinkers as old-fashioned, superficial, and mistaken. It is for me, a student of my revered teacher Mises, and an avid follower of the writings of Hayek, it's for me a pleasure to point out the subtle, profound, and critically important contributions which these intellectual heroes of mine have made to a clear understanding of what a market economy means and what it achieves. As it turns out, I will associate Ludwig Mises especially with entrepreneurship, while I will associate Friedrich Hayek principally with competition. It will, however, be my goal to explain how Hayek's notion of competition is in fact inseparable from Mises' notion of entrepreneurship, while Mises' insights in entrepreneurship imply Hayek's understanding of competition. This is not at all to claim that Hayek's economic theory is identical with that of Mises. It is, however, to claim that Mises and Hayek did share a common general understanding of what a market economy means and what it can achieve. By a pure market system, we mean an economic system in which means of production are owned exclusively by independent private entities. This means that decisions concerning the use of these means of production are made by their private owners or their employees, not by government officials. Although in the real world that we are familiar with, most decisions in regard to productive services are, at least in part, circumscribed by governmental regulations. Laws of minimum and maximum prices, laws limiting the size of firms, and so on, it proves intellectually useful to explore the operation of a market, system, market economy by initially imagining such a market to be a pure market economy, with government control limited to, the, uh, to, the, to administering the security of the legally recognized system of property rights. We can then, on the basis of our understanding how the purely free market uh, operates, we can then assess the possible need for systematic government regulations and or the likely consequences of such regulation. Many years ago, I heard Professor Hayek claim that the most simple and the most basic law of economics was the law of the single price. There is a powerful tendency, this law maintains, for a single price to prevail throughout the market for its given good. As soon as such a good happens to be selling at different prices in different parts of the same market, 
market forces will emerge that will tend to push up prices where they have been low and push down prices where they have been high. William Stanley Jevons, the great British 19th century economist, talked about what he called the law of indifference, which he meant, by which he meant the law of the single price. But for Jevons, the law of the single price was an identity. It had to be that way. But there was no possibility of more than one price. Hayek pointed out that the law was a tendency. There is a tendency for a single price to emerge. I have often pondered over this law, which I will, for the purposes of today's talk, call Hayek's law. This law, Hayek's law, I will attempt to show, can illustrate clearly both what Mises called entrepreneurship and what Hayek understood as competition. By focusing on this simple law, we can achieve a great deal of insight into how a market economy works. Let us examine the case where a given good, whatever it is, is available from one prospective seller at a low price, and at the same time, uh, some buyers are offering a higher price to secure the same item. This situation is, at first glance, absurd. Some buyers are spending more for this item than they need to. It is available elsewhere in the same market for less. A similar absurdity consists in the fact that some sellers are, by hypothesis, satisfied to receive less for this item than others are, in fact, willing to pay. For Jevons, this absurdity is, translates into the impossibility of any violation of his law of indifference. And it, it, for Hayek, it is this absurdity which underlies the tendency, which he postulates, for a single price to emerge throughout the same, throughout the same market for the, for the given good. For, because those buyers now happy to pay the higher price will sooner or later become aware that they can do better somewhere else in the market. Those sellers now happy to sell for the lower price will sooner or later become aware that they can do better elsewhere in the market. The lower prices will tend to rise, the higher prices will tend to fall until there is the tendency will be fulfilled for a single price to emerge. All well, this is very elementary. But let's stand back and re-examine this tendency. Obviously, the buyers who had been paying the higher price had not been aware of the available lower prices. The sellers who had sold for the lower price had obviously not been aware of the eager buyers willing to pay the higher price. Truthfully, there is no absurdity at all in the hypothesized situation that we describe. There is simply unexplained, pervasive ignorance. In fact, it may be argued, such ignorance does not demand any explanation. It is a pervasive fact of life. Ignorance is the basic fact of life. At the same time, we have claimed, that is Hayek's lawyers has claimed, that there is a powerful tendency for such interpersonal ignorance spontaneously to dissipate sooner or later. And as interpersonal knowledge improves, the tendency towards a single price will eventually be realized. But we have to ask ourselves, what is it in the initial state of affairs, the initial state of ignorance, what is it that assures us that sooner or later the initially postulated interpersonal ignorance will tend to lift? What makes it what makes, it, uh, what makes it sure that this tendency will be fulfilled? After all, if we suppose, for example, that the different parts of the market are in different parts of the city or different parts of the, uh, different rooms in the same building, it is not obvious what systematic process of interpersonal learning will guarantee the tendency claimed by Hayek's law. To postulate such a systematic process may not seem very unrealistic, but it is worth digging a little deeper into the basis for such postulation. 
Most of us will agree that if indeed any initial state of affairs exists in which two prices prevail in the market for a given good, this creates an opportunity for pure entrepreneurial profit. You can buy low and sell high. Sooner or later, someone is likely to discover that he can buy in one room at a low price and sell the same item at a higher price in the next room. The phenomenon of two prices itself constitutes the opportunity for pure entrepreneurial profit. The mere fact that you have two prices is a profit opportunity. It is reasonable to imagine that such opportunities will tend to be discovered and exploited. Pushing up the lower price and pushing down the higher price, opportunities for pure profit do tend to be discovered. Such a tendency for profit discovery does seem reasonable and almost inevitable. Let us ponder this insight into Hayek's law and perceive how simultaneously it illustrates both Mises's notion of entrepreneurship and Hayek's notion of competition. Mises called his 1949 magnum opus human action. By human action, Mises was referring to human decision making in a way that had hitherto been overlooked in economics textbooks. Before Mises, and unfortunately still in many contemporary textbooks, the economic decision was formulated according to a pattern often referred to as constrained maximization. According to this pattern, a decision maker, such as a potential buyer, is seen as facing an array of known alternatives. He will, standard theory assumes, pick the alternative that he values most highly. He maximizes his utility subject to the constraint offered by the limited array of known available opportunities. The technical term is his budget constraint. The decision is nothing more than an exercise in mathematics. There is no agony involved in making such a decision. Not the kind of agony when a person has to decide whether or not to get married. <laughs> There's no agony in making this decision. This is simply a mathematical calculation. No agony. There's simply the mental labor required to ensure a selection out of the given array of alternatives of that alternative already declared to be the most preferred. Mises, delving more deeply into the meaning of an economic decision, understood that such constraint maximization fails to grasp what is in fact involved in any human act of choice. Another writer who rebelled against the constrained maximization formulation is the great British <coughs> scholar George Shackleton. What Mises pointed out was that when we observe a person selecting one out of an array of options which we know to be available to him, we should recognize that in making that selection, he is not necessarily expressing his ranking of these options that we know to be available, because up until the moment of choice, he may not have been aware of each of the components of this given array. In fact, up until the moment of choice, he may not have realized the very existence or the very availability or desirability of the option that he in fact selects. So that his decision is not so much a maximizing decision as an articulation of his discovery of the availability and desirability of the option which he, which he grasps. A human being is at each moment forced to determine what is in fact available to him. At each moment he seeks to discover that which he may have hitherto overlooked. This is what Mises meant when he made the profound statement that in each moment of decision making, in any real and living economy, every actor is always an entrepreneur. Every actor. Every actor is always an entrepreneur. This is why Mises called his magnum opus on economics, he called it human action. 
a human being acts as an entrepreneur. He operates in a world not of given known alternatives, but in an open-ended world in which the actor must determine, that is, he must discover what the future holds. We are choosing not between given alternatives here today, but alternative pictures of the future. The future that he must anticipate is by its very nature not given, not known. Action is much more than mathematical calculation. There is agony in choice. The entrepreneur in acting is expressing what he believes to be the future. For Mises, this pattern of action is the basis for all our economic understanding. Once we recognize that the tendency described by Hayek's law can be explained in terms of the entrepreneurial goal of grasping the pure opportunity which has been discovered in the phenomenon of multiple prices, we can re-examine what we earlier described as the simplest explanation for the tendency postulated by Hayek's law. We pointed out that buyers initially paying the higher price for something that's available at a lower price will sooner or later realize that this item is in fact available at the lower price. We pointed out correspondingly that sellers now selling for the lower price will sooner or later realize that there are buyers who are now paying a higher price. What we wish to emphasize now is that in postulating that sooner or later market participants will realize what they had hitherto overlooked, we are attributing to these market participants an element of sound entrepreneurial alertness to hitherto unperceived opportunities. We are crediting these market participants with the capacity to discover that which they had hitherto overlooked. So that our discussion has led us to the insight that Hayek's law, the tendency for a multiple price market to transform itself into a single price market is a tendency which we can attribute to Misesian entrepreneurship. A system of economic theory in which there is no recognition of the entrepreneurial element in human action is unable properly to account for what Hayek saw as the simplest yet most far-reaching law of economics. Now you may think that this law, Hayek's law, the single price, is not very important. It's perhaps true, but not very important. But in fact, this law describes a tendency which underlies just about everything we know about markets. It does not, it is not restricted to the simple situation of arbitrage that we've just been describing. The truth is that this same law operates in far more complex contexts. Think of international commerce. No one is forced to recognize that such trade is indeed driven by precisely those entrepreneurial ventures which we found to underlie the simple cases in which Hayek's law operates. <coughs> An entrepreneur realizes that the price being paid now or likely to be paid in the future in Europe for a given quantity of spices or rubber or tea or whatever is significantly lower, is significantly higher than the prices needed in the West Indies or wherever to procure those same items. The price spread is, let us imagine, much larger than the per unit cost of sending ships across the ocean to bring these items to markets in Europe. The trade movements so generated are the very same movements which are in effect postulated by Hayek's law to account for the, for the tendency which that basic law describes. And what is true in regard to these situations is perhaps, perhaps less obviously also true in every case in which an entrepreneur undertakes to manufacture a new product or to manufacture an existing product by using a new technique of production. His entrepreneurial instinct has alerted him to a multi-price situation. He believes that by buying a package of inputs, raw materials, energy, labor, machine time, he will put himself in the position to sell the same package, 
but now in the physical form of a product at a higher price he has discovered or at least believes himself to have discovered a multi-price situation offering the opportunity for pure profit Hayek's law is thus a description of the entrepreneurial tendencies which drive all facets of market activity, whether in the form of straightforward arbitrage, or of international trade, or of innovative production. These tendencies are at all time fueled by the same drive which is identical with Misesian entrepreneurship. It was this understanding which enabled Mises to identify with precision and with profound insight the elusive explanation for the phenomenon of pure profit. Economic theorists, since the, history, since the beginning of the history of economic theory, economic theorists have labored mightily during past eras of history of economic theory to identify the meaning of and to account for the very possibility of pure profit. Why should there ever be pure profit? Why should anybody get something for nothing? <coughs> this is what pure profit is, something for nothing. Why should there be that case? Economic theorists have labored mightily to, to explain it. Mises was able in three sentences to penetrate to the very heart of the matter. What he said was this, what makes profit emerge is the fact that the entrepreneur who judges the future prices of the products more correctly than other people do buys some or all of the factors of production at prices which, seen from the point of view of the future state of the market, are too low. Thus the total cost of production, including interest, lag behind the prices which the entrepreneur receives for his product. The difference is entrepreneurial profit. The same profit that characterized the initial multi-price situation uh, described in Hayek's law. Surely, once we recognize how the market system largely consists of the actions of its entrepreneurial part participants in pursuit of pure profit, we have discovered indeed that Hayek's law is central to the most sophisticated and complex of market economies. So far we've been focusing on, on, the, on the entrepreneurial element which underlies the powerful and far-reaching tendencies described in Hayek's law. But we must go further. We must recognize that these tendencies can operate only in a context in which all current market participants are open to the competition of outsiders prepared to disrupt existing conditions. Imagine that in two adjacent rooms, separate markets have generated different prices for the same item. In the room where price is high, buyers are obviously oblivious to the fact that they could go next door and get the same item for less. In the room where prices is, price is low, sellers are obviously unaware that they could go next door and get more. This situation made possible by the wall separating two rooms, or two continents, or two decades, that wall may be a strong one. The sellers selling at the high price may feel outraged if outsiders enter their room and offer to sell at lower prices. Producers who have for many years used one method of production may feel outraged at outsiders who disrupt, who disrupt a cozy situation by brashly innovating a more efficient technique. They may regard these outsiders as robbing them of something which is theirs. The tendency described by Hayek's law takes it for granted that no seller is protected from the competition of other, perhaps more innovative or alert, potential sellers. Hayek's law depends not only on recession entrepreneurship, it depends also on freedom for competition. Were there to be a legal framework protecting exist existing firms from the competition of new firms, then the tendencies described by Hayek's law would be paralyzed. Entrepreneurial discovery would be blocked by the barriers to competitive entry. 
not only would competitors not be able to enter, they wouldn't be free to discover that there's anything profitable to, uh, for them to enter. But all this requires that we examine more carefully what economists have meant by the term competition. I have a section here entitled The Meaning of Competition. Now the, this title happens to be the identical title with a brilliantly profound and iconoclastic paper by, by Hayek, which he first presented as a lecture at Princeton University in 1946, and then published two or three years later as chapter five in his uh, collection of papers, Individualism and Economic Order, The Meaning of Competition. Mises once said me, read that paper. He, 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 did, he, he specifically instructed me to read The Meaning of Competition. Hayek focused his critical attention on the widespread belief among his contemporary economic theorists that the term competition and the adjective competitive should refer to a state of affairs which in its precise form corresponds to the textbook, textbook model of perfect competition. Perfect competition, as used in the textbooks, involves a state of affairs in which, among other conditions, many, many firms and many, many buyers are participants in the market. No one buyer, no one seller can affect price. Every buyer and every seller is aware of what everybody else is doing. That is required for perfect competition. Any departure from the full presence of all these conditions required for perfect competition means that for those economists, and unfortunately for many of today's textbooks, the competition, that the real world competition, which in which some of these conditions may be absent, is described as imperfect or monopolistic. For this terminology, the adjective competitive refers strictly to the perfectly competitive model. Certainly, many of these same economists came to realize that for, for, for that this is not what the word competition means in everyday talk. But what was often not recognized is that the textbook's use of language suffers from far more than linguistic confusion. In the hypothesized state of perfect competition, it is necessary to assume not only that there are many, many small participants active in the market, but also that these participants already possess complete information in regard to all other participants and potential participants. So we're talking about a state of affairs where everybody already knows everything. We're not talking about the state of affairs where there's initial ignorance. We are talking about the state of affairs where everybody already knows everything. That's what competition is meant to, um, is meant, uh, to, uh, to refer to in the standard terminology. This assumption is clearly spelled out in the textbook's list of conditions that must be satisfied in order for a market to be perfectly competitive. But to assume such a perfectly com perfect knowledge concerning a market is, as Hayek pointed out in that paper, The Meaning of Competition, to assume that state of affairs already to exist which the process of competition tends to bring about. Notice that Hayek is here contrasting a notion of competition which describes a process with a textbook notion of competition as a desired state of affairs. So there's a world of difference between a competitive process and what is, the, what is a state of affairs in which everybody already knows everything. To be more explicit, we take note of Hayek's concluding comments in that same paper. Competition, he pointed out, is essentially a process of the formation of opinion. By spreading information, it creates, that is competition creates, that unity and coherence of the economic system which we presuppose when we think of it as one model. In other words, instead of viewing competition as a state of perfect mutual knowledge, it is necessary to recognize the competitive process by which we gradually move from a less well-informed state into a better informed state. It's worth noting how our discussion of the tendency described in Hayek's law 
illustrates the crucial issue separating Hayek's notion of competition as a process from the textbook notion of a state of, uh, of, of, a state of perfect competition. The very possibility of any initial situation in which a given item is being bought and sold at different prices in the same market is ruled out as soon as one is asked to consider a state of perfect competition. If your analysis says we're going to be talking about a state of perfect competition, we are not talking about that state of affairs to which Hayek's law is referring. To assume perfect knowledge is to assume a state of affairs in which no buyer pays more than the lowest price in the market and which, in which no seller accepts less than the highest price paid in the market. These assumptions necessarily rule out the initial situation which is the subject of Hayek's law. And that, of course, is why Jevons, operating with something very similar to the perfectly competitive model, assumed that the law of indifference was always, always fulfilled in, at, at every point in time. Yet we have pointed out and emphasized that the tendency for the initial multiple price situation to gravitate towards a single price conclusion depends utterly on the possibility of outside competition. If higher price sellers were to be protected from the competition of lower price sellers, if low price buyers were to have their bargains immune to the competition of other buyers offering higher prices, it is obvious that the tendency described by Hayek's law would be paralyzed. That powerful tendency, which as we saw was held by Hayek to be the foundation of market coordination in all dimensions, whether it's international trade or production of new innovation of new products, this powerful tendency is fueled by the entry of competitors who as buyers bid prices up or as sellers push them down. This is not consistent with the state of affairs in which no buyer can affect the price and no seller can affect the price. But not only is such competition obviously something quite different from perfect competition, in that it fails to fulfill the latter's condition for complete knowledge, it is different in a more direct way. Perfect competition assumes a multitude of buyers and sellers, with this assumption being seen as a guarantee that no buyer, no seller is significant enough to affect the market price. But the competition needed to justify Hayek's law is competition which must change price. What we saw in the tendency described by Hayek's law is that the entering sellers forced down the prices that were too high. The entering buyers bid up the prices that were low. Nothing in this tendency depends on the existence of large numbers of buyers and sellers. Everything depends on the ability of entrance to reveal the absence of complete knowledge responsible for the initial entrepreneurial buyers and sellers. But for the initial multi-price situation, the powerful effect of entering onto entrepreneurial buyers and or sellers surely an effect that we should describe as a manifestation of competition in no way depends on any one of the conditions associated with the textbook competition. So far, what we have found that Hayek's law rests on what Mises identified as the entrepreneurial element in human behavior, and at the same time we have found that it rests on freedom of entry which we have identified with, with Hayekian competition. What we will now show, however, is in fact that a deeper understanding of both entrepreneurship and of competition reveals that Hayekian competition means the presence of entrepreneurial entry. Or to put it equivalently but differently, Misesian entrepreneurship consists in the competitive entry emphasized by Hayek. <laughs> I mean, the next section is entitled Competition as a Discovery Procedure. That is the title of another outstanding paper by Hayek. This paper was first presented as a lecture in 1968. It was published in the German version in the same year and was first published in English in the 1978 volume of Hayek's papers, Competition as a Discovery Procedure. From the, from the perspective of today's talk, 
Hayek's paper that patent competition as a discovery procedure can be recognized as complementing his earlier above cited paper, the media competition. In particular, in particular, by focusing, in his title, by focusing on the concept of discovery, competition as a discovery procedure, Hayek was, was indirectly drawing attention to a crucially important, <coughs> often overlooked aspect of the information which the Hayekian competitive process tends to reveal. There is a vast difference between deliberately producing information on the one hand and the discovery of hitherto wholly unsuspected facts on the other. If one wishes to search for a particular historical fact, I want to know what year was Hayek born. That's historical fact. I know that he was born in, at some year. I want to know what the, what the information is. So I, 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 I know the value, I know the existence, and perhaps I know the value of this piece of information. If in addition one already knows what sources, in what sources that fact can be ascertained, then the research work needed is entirely parallel to the work needed to produce any other product. One assembles the necessary tools and raw materials, and as expected and planned, the desired result emerges. You look up uh, the sources that you, in which you know Hayek's birthday will be uh, mentioned, and you, you've, got, you've got what you want to produce. One knew in advance what cost would be worth the value of the product. One knew in advance what costs were in fact required to achieve the desired result. And the decision to produce such information is a simple economic decision. It can be formulated as an exercise in constrained maximization. But that's totally different from the discovery of information, the very existence of which has hitherto been unsuspected. Their discovery refers to grasping knowledge that one didn't know existed. You didn't know what you didn't know. You didn't know that you didn't know anything. And it is information of this kind which the Hayekian competitive process is able to uncover. This kind of information cannot be deliberately searched for. Its discovery does not constitute a deliberate constrained maximization exercise. After all, one did not know there was anything that, that was anything that one didn't know. The increase in interpersonal information generated by the competitive process is something that emerges from that process. It need not include any deliberate learning at all. The knowledge that is gained during this process has not been produced. It has, as Hayek's title indicated, has been discovered. Much of the massive regulatory apparatus administered in our country at all levels of government consists in well-meaning attempts to ensure that, that markets are competitive. Quote unquote competitive. The prevailing mindset recognizes, perhaps somewhat vaguely, that the prosperity of our nation its extraordinary record of economic growth are attributable to our competitive market system. However, this mainstream view maintains, our competitive market system is in constant danger of becoming less competitive and thus more monopolistic and certainly less perfect. To protect the consumer from what are seen as powerful tendencies for markets to become more monopolistic, it is necessary for government to ensure that firms do not become too big, that they do not dominate their respective industries, that they do not conspire to keep prices high. In other words, it is necessary, so the prevailing mainstream view proceeds, to limit and constrain spontaneous entrepreneurial movement. We would like here to point out that this prevailing mindset reflects serious misunderstanding of the way in which the market system operates and how, in fact, the beneficial consequences of the system are generated. Although the insights of the present talk are extremely simple and elementary, it turns out that they have been disastrously overlooked 
in the prevailing philosophy supporting massive regulation in order to maintain competition. To put it very directly, what we have surely shown is that the obvious irrationalities represented by a mark by a multi-price situation tend spontaneously to disappear during an entrepreneurial process which in no way depends on controlling the size of individual firms or on the proportion of the industry made up by any one firm or group of allied firms. We have in fact seen that the competitive entrepreneurial process depends solely on the presence of one crucial condition, freedom of entry. Freedom of entry means freedom of entry for firms of any size. That freedom of entry means the absence of regulation blocking the competitive entry of any would-be entrepreneur should surely be an obvious conclusion to be drawn from our earlier discussion. By blocking the entry of new entrepreneurial ventures in any market, the authorities are paralyzing the spontaneous discovery process which we have seen to constitute the essence of market activity. To block such entry in order to prevent prices from rising, to prevent any one firm from becoming too big, is to claim that the regulatory authorities know in advance of the market what the right price is and what the right structure is for the relevant industry. But we have pointed out that the Hayekian competitive process tends to reveal facts and circumstances which have hitherto not been known to anyone, even government authorities, believe it or not, <laughs> to see the advantages of competition as consisting in conformity to what authorities believe themselves already to know is drastically to misunderstand what Lisa's Hayek economic theory has taught us that a free market consists of a process of entrepreneurial discovery. To recognize such a discovery, such a discovery procedure, it is necessary to admit that the authorities do not necessarily know everything. In particular, the authorities do not know what possibilities are waiting around the corner to be exploited. It is the lure of pure profit which alerts entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial firms to the presence of hitherto unknown and totally unsuspected opportunities that might be waiting around the corner. There is nothing in the reward system appropriate for the regulatory authorities that can match the discovery potential implicit in the opportunity to grasp pure profit. As many writers, including Hayek, have pointed out, the dominant view which fails to recognize all this, suffers from a failure to understand the very need for a discovery process. The value of what the dominant view understands as a competitive market does not, in their view, derive from its discovery potential. It consists, in their view, in the allocative efficiency held to be the welfare implication of perfectly competitive market equilibrium. In order to appreciate the harm which such a perspective can wreak, it is necessary to critically analyze the unfortunate place which the goal of allocated efficiency has played in modern economic understanding, or perhaps better, in modern economic misunderstanding. Yeah. It was the great British economist, Lionel Robbins, they became Lord Robbins, who focused the professional attention of economists on the notion of allocated efficiency. In his important 1932 book, The Nature and Significance of Economic Science, Robbins spent a good deal of space in trying to arrive at a sound definition of the term economic. The economic aspect of any issue, he argued, refers to the degree of allocative efficiency achievable under alternative ways of addressing that issue. To economize, Robbins concluded, is to arrange the uses to which the array of available means is put in such a way as to maximize the value of the ends so achieved. Means are necessarily limited. 
A person's ends, his goals, are, on the other hand, without limit. To economize means to attempt to utilize the scarce means available in that pattern of usage that will, in the economizer's best judgment, achieve the fullest satisfaction of his goals. There is much wisdom and insight in this classic work of Robbins, and it's no accident that Robbins was deeply influenced by the Austrian economists of the 1920s. Robbins had visited the University of Vienna in the 1920s and had a high regard for the Austrian economists with whom he interacted during his visits. It was largely Robbins who invited Hayek to London. However, the economics profession, and especially the economics textbooks, picked up Robbins' idea and illegitimately extended it to areas in which that idea has no relevance. And in fact, they, they extended it to areas in which that idea turns out to generate serious and harmful misunderstanding. What the textbooks did was to extend the Robinsian notion of economizing, the notion of achieving allocated efficiency, from the level of the individual where it does apply, and which was the level at which Robbins was writing, what they have done is to extend that to the level of the nation as a whole, where it doesn't apply. Just as Robbins pointed out that each individual seeks to avoid waste, he seeks to avoid directing a unit of a resource to producing less value than it might have produced if directed elsewhere, so too the textbooks cavalierly concluded, without debate or reservations, a nation also faces a similar economic problem to allocate its overall total of resources in the pattern that can maximize the total value of national output. In fact, this idea has spread throughout the textbook industry to the point where the very function of an economic system, that is the manner in which a nation might conduct its economic affairs, either as a plain socialist economic system, or as a free market system, or as some hybrid system, <laughs> The very function of an economic system has been defined as consisting in finding the best solution for a nation's economic problem as per this above textbook definition. So that the task of economics is seen as that of solving a nation's economic, that is, its allocated problem. An economy in this mainstream perspective is seen as a global unit within which the global allocative efficiency in which global allocative efficiency needs to be achieved. Two writers who have separately pointed out the confusion in so extending Robin's useful insight from the individual level to the societal level were James Buchanan and Friedrich Hayek. Buchanan pointed out the confusion in his 1963 presidential address to the Southern Economic Association. Hayek did so somewhat indirectly by pointing out the confusion implicit in the very notion of the economy. We may, drawing on both of these writers, explain the confusion as, confusion as follows. Robin's notion of allocative efficiency at the individual level is an idea which takes its start from Robin's definition of the economic problem faced by an individual. Given scarce means must be allocated wisely in order to maximize the achievement of given multiple ends. The crucial point is that both the means and the ends are for the individual given. That is, he knows what he wants and he knows what resources he has available to him. His choice of a production plan, given his information, is a mathematical exercise. The one that we described earlier as constrained maximization. But as soon as one leaves the level of the individual and considers the level of society as a, as a unit, it becomes apparent that Robin's economic problem has no obvious counterpart at the societal level at all. Even if one imagines oneself to be an omnipotent socialist planner, seeking earnestly and honestly to ensure societal efficiency, it should be immediately obvious that unless the imagined um, um, omnipotent planner is also imagined to be omniscient, it's obvious that that planner lacks the basic framework needed in order to recognize the need for, for the efficient allocation of societal resources. 
That is, we have not yet identified what arrays of goods and services are most highly valued and what arrays of resources are available to be allocated. As Hayek pointed out again and again, in order to be able to speak of an economy as a unit, we need to rely on a market process to identify the available resources, to, uh, to assign them values based on their usefulness in alternative industries, and to assign values to alternative consumer goods. Without such a market process, we cannot even formulate a societal economic problem at all. Without the information generated by such a market process, the very notion of a central planner seeking efficiently to allocate society's resources is an empty one. But the meaninglessness of the notion of the economy, that is of a society facing the task of allocating its resources efficiently, is present not merely in the context of a hypothetically socialized society, it is present even more obviously in the context of a market society. To state that the function of the market is to allocate society's resources efficiently is to engage in self-obfuscation. In a market economic system with countless independent individual resource owners and decision makers with no central authority directing the pattern of resource utilization, the very framework for a Robinsian economizing problem is absent. It should in fact be obvious that interpersonal ignorance in a market setting is itself the challenge which each and every decision maker confronts in that setting. In fact, what we've learned in our discussion of the Hayekian competitive process was that it was this process itself and only this process that has the capacity to communicate to decision makers sufficient information about their fellow decision makers that might make interpersonal, interpersonal exchange both possible and mutually beneficial. We are now in a position to sum up the practical implications of the theoretical insights we have learned from Mises and from Hayek. Perhaps the most important impl implication to be learned is, as developed in, in, in these last, last portions of our talk, that in a market system it is totally inappropriate for the regulatory authorities to seek to achieve societal efficiency in the allocation of its resources. Thus attempts to adjust the sizes of, of firms and the structure of industries to fit the pattern of that perfectly competitive equilibrium model must be so frustrating. In fact, the second most important implication of our theoretical discussion may well be that the, the conclusion that such well-meaning attempts to improve societal efficiency, the allocation of resources, constitute blockages against entrepreneurial entry and thus frustrate the operation of the market's own amazingly fertile discovery procedure. It may be true that the merger of several large firms seems to threaten monopolization of their industry, but we must never forget that so long as competitive entry is indeed free, the effects of such monopolization must always be held in check by the realization that supernormal profits always tend to invite in fresh competitive entrepreneurial entry. We must never forget that we do not know what the optimum size of the firm should be. To block a merger is to block entry. We must never forget that the definition of an industry is never carved in stone. Entrepreneurial competition consists not only in firms entering an existing industry, but in its creating an entirely new industry, or in changing a given product so drastically as almost to appear to be creating a new industry. All authoritarian obstacles to such innovative entry constitute obstacles to the discovery process of the market. At the outside of my talk today, I refer to my two intellectual heroes in economics, Ludwig Mises and Friedrich Hayek. We have explored the lesson that Mises taught us about entrepreneurship. 
We have explored the lesson which Hayek taught us about the competitive process. Our explorations have taught us that the entrepreneurial process is the competitive process. That the competitive process is the entrepreneurial process. These lessons we have discovered have their own powerful implications for public policy. These implications do not by themselves prove that laissez-faire is the best economic policy. The Free Market Institute has lots of work to do besides this paper. <laughs> there are many aspects of a market economy which are unrelated, or at least not directly related, to the insights that we have emphasized as emerging from the work of Mises and Hayek. Certainly the complete case for a free market economy, free of all authoritarian interventions, may need to go beyond the considerations referred to in this paper. But the Mises Hayek insights that we've described do have enormously important consequences for public policy. These insights make us aware of what society loses in its vain attempts to achieve the illusory goal of societal efficiency in the allocation of its resources. What it loses, we found, is the set of powerful forces unleashed by entrepreneurial competition that tend to promote the discovery of available resources hitherto unknown, the discovery of technological possibilities hitherto unknown, and the discovery of hitherto unknown ways of meeting consumer needs. And discovery of opportunities hitherto unknown for mutually beneficial exchange among members of society. It is true that no one can in, ad in advance identify the discoveries which a given regulatory edict may tend to discourage. It is precisely this lack of knowledge, the fact that we don't know what a, what a intervention is, is what, what discoveries and intervention is discouraging, precisely this lack of knowledge that requires us to point out the known, unknown cost of regulation. We know that there are cost of regulations, we don't know what they are. We know that we cannot know specifically what regulation costs society. Therefore, we know that such regulation is likely to be very costly indeed. To recognize as a generalization that the cost of regulation exists is not by itself to condemn the efficiency consequences of such regulation. But when we contemplate the enormously complex and economic improvements that have occurred in Western societies over the past several centuries, improvements which we now recognize as attributable to the entrepreneurial competitive forces unleashed by the market system, we must appreciate the seriousness of the implications of the brilliant Mises Hayek insights that we have explored. Thank you very much.